the message. Yep. Morning, everyone. We'll just get started now. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, welcome, and thanks to everyone who managed to walk up the hill. If that's what you're doing today. Um, this is our first ever in-person event for the Women in Foundation Industries Network. And I know that some of you here, you've probably never heard of the Foundation Industries before, but you've inadvertently been working in them, working alongside them, and tapping into that supply chain. So Bruce will um, give a brief overview of what the Transforming Foundation Industry Challenge is all about, but just very quickly, um, I wanted to welcome everyone here and online um, and just tell you that the network, we have a very clear vision, which is to raise the profile of women innovators within the foundation industries and the related material sectors um, and enable the inno inno innovator. So for example, today we'll be really focused on circular economy and we've got our two amazing facilitators here as well. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you're just starting out, you've got experience or you're the most experienced, I think it'll be a really valuable opportunity today. We've got a few more events planned um, for later in the year as well. So we'll, we'll keep you in the loop in case they align with your interests. So I'll hand over to Bruce now. Yes, sorry. Um, so, um, Transforming Foundation Industry Challenge. So yes, I'm Bruce Adley. Um, I'm director of the, the, the challenge. Um, I have a team of about half a dozen or so people uh, working uh, based in, in Innovate within UKRI. Um, in terms of what we do, um, to me, in one sense, it's very, very simple. This is what, this is what we're after. Yeah. Essentially, the reality is, is that if we're to achieve net zero, if we're to make our society as sustainable as we want it to be in the future, the foundation industries, not only in the UK, but globally, must effectively completely decarbonize and have achieved the vast majority of that decarbonization um, by, by 2050. And indeed, in the UK, there are some really quite high targets uh, for 2030 for the foundation industries. So not only is this a big change need to be made, a big new change needs to be made rapidly. Uh, and that's why the challenge has come into existence. I'm not going to go into massive detail in, in this short introduction. Um, I, there's just a couple more slides um, that I will use in a moment. I'm around all day, uh, uh, apart from between two and three, so please come and ask me wider questions um, about the challenge. So, what have we been up to and what are we still doing? As we set out, as a challenge, um, we had 66 million pounds of public funding, um, and the then Bay Secretary of State set us as a challenge uh, the aim to get at least 83 million pounds of co-investment in from the, the private sector. So effectively, we were 149 million pounds four-year project or four-year program uh, to deliver uh, what I've just been describing, or to make make that happen as much as as much as possible. The realities of COVID mean we're going a bit longer. The realities of getting the Treasury to allow us to start and spend the money meant we're going a bit longer. So we will be around until March 2025. And I'm pleased to say that so far we've achieved an awful lot um, through establishing glass futures up at St. Helens, which is pilot facilities uh, for, the, for the glass sector principally, but also supporting the wider foundation industries. And hopefully you'll see as you look at that, yeah, we've been able to broaden the pipeline of innovation right through from university across the TRLs that we primarily cover into getting companies up and running with their first manufacturing facilities. Only last week I was at the opening of a, a fermentation based uh, chemicals company, Polyfirm, over in um, the Wirral, yeah, where they set up their first continuous manufacturing process, and they're going to be moving from having 50 or 60 people working for them to several hundred by 2026 and going global. And it's those sort of things that we're, we're trying we're trying to see. So lots happening. Um, 
we're also already, even though we're two years to go, looking towards the future. Uh, and one of the things we've already established looking towards the future, the smile at the back that we've been talking about quite a lot, um, is the, the Economizer program. Um, this program is designed to increase uh, the level of scale-up facilities that are available to companies that are innovating in the foundation industry space by bringing together primarily RTOs um, across the industries, but making use of private companies uh, where necessary. So uh, you've seen it's su supported by Lucidian there. So we'll be working right across the foundation industry space on that. And they are forming a consortium to take forward this in, in the, coming, the coming years. Um, and we hope to see significant further announcements over the next 12 months in terms of where we're going on the foundation industries. But that's more than enough for me now. Back to Milan. Thanks, Bruce. Um, just really quickly, does anyone want to raise their hand if they've forgotten what the foundation industries are? I've just realized none of us have said what they are. Yeah. So the foundation industries are the cement, chemicals, paper, ceramics, glass, and metal sectors. And I know some people here today from plastics and textiles, but these are all interweaving supply chains. You know, we, we tap into automotive, transport, all of those kind of areas. So yeah, if, if you need a reminder of any of those six, just uh, let me know. <laughs> Um, this event today is actually in collaboration with the Circular Economy Hub based here in Exeter. So um, I'd be delighted to have Fiona um, Charnley, who's uh, director um, of the Hub, to come and uh, do her introduction as well. Great, thank you very much, um, Neelam, and um, welcome to the University of Exeter. It's fantastic to see so many of you uh, have made it all, all this way. Um, so my name is Fiona Charnley. I'm a professor of circular innovation um, at the University of Exeter in the Business School, and I am co-director of the Exeter Centre for the Circular Economy, which is an internal uh, centre within the university, and then also, as Neelam mentioned, co-director of the Circular Economy Hub, which I'll talk to you a little bit about. Um, so just wanted to give a, a bit of an overview of the university and where kind of sustainability fits into that. So sustainability has always been a really strong theme um, at the University of Exeter, but now kind of even more so. So we um, are home to five of the top um, 100 climate scientists, which means that everything we do, whether it's in research or education, is very evidence-based. So we're really providing that evidence base to inform decisions of policy makers, government, and importantly, uh, industry. Um, we've also won a number of different awards um, due to our um, focus um, on the environment in particular, but, but wider sustainability, including um, the Business School of the Year Award um, this year by the Times Higher Education. Um, and we have 12 leading research centres within the wider area of um, sustainability. One of those is, is focused on the circular economy um, and very much recognise the role that the circular economy plays in um, tackling climate challenges. So the Exeter Centre for the Circular Economy uh, was launched in 2018 um, by uh, Ellen MacArthur. Uh, we have a, a long-standing relationship with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We've worked with them for the last um, 11 or 12 years to try and develop kind of the framework around the circular economy and, importantly, to research how that translates into businesses uh, across different sectors of, of all different sizes. Um, and really, one of the, our key ambitions is to be um, internationally recognised as the leading UK, if not global, centre for the circular economy in terms of our research and um, education as well. So um, these are kind of the three areas that we are pioneering in, research, education, and also our um, outreach, so business and policy engagement. And we have a number of, of different projects, either funded uh, through public funding, government funding, but also working with a lot of industrial partners. So a lot of our funding comes directly from industry. And one of the biggest programs that we're working on at the moment is the NICER program, which some of you may have heard of. So National Interdisciplinary Circular Economy Research Program. And this is the biggest um, program to date that is funded uh, by UKRI looking to accelerate and upscale our transition in the UK towards a circular economy. So it's a £30 million uh, programme. It's a four-year programme, and we're currently two years in, just past the halfway point. And the programme consists of five individual centres of excellence, each focusing on a particular resource flow. So we have one in textiles, construction minerals, metals, technology metals and chemicals. 
and then we have an integrating hub um, which I lead along with my colleague uh, Peter Hopkinson uh, in Exeter. Um, the uh, programme is also supported by £2.5 million worth of Innovate UK funding, which is targeted directly at SMEs, so it's kind of seed funding to support small and medium-sized businesses innovating in the area of circular economy. And another important point is that it's, very, uh, it's a strategic priorities fund um, programme, so that means it's very heavily sponsored and supported by UK government, so DEFRA, Bayes and, and other devolved administrations. And I think one of the, the most important points of this programme is that it's not a typical kind of research grant where you get the money and four years later you kind of write up some papers and, and say what you've done. I mean it's a very heavily monitored programme by government, but also by the funding councils and, and industry as well who have put match funding into the programme. So really creating outputs and outcomes and impact is really important throughout the, the programme. Uh, so I thought given the focus on the foundation industries, I've provided a bit of information on this slide um, about the individual centres that are based at different universities across the UK. So I won't um, read out this, but you can find out a lot more about these centres and what they're each doing uh, on, on the website, which I've provided the link to. And then the hub, um, which, as I said, is, is based at Exeter. Really, the role of the hub is, is twofold. First of all, to coordinate the programme as a whole. So obviously, the um, transition towards a, a circular economy requires a systems change. And without the hub, there would be a risk that the five centres would each kind of do their own thing and, and there wouldn't be kind of that coordination. So the hub is really interested in those cross-cutting themes around the circular economy. <coughs> so things like policy, data, design, business models, um, equality and diversity, all of the things that actually are really important to advancing circular economy, but are um, common you know, across, across different businesses, across different governments and, and different sectors. So one of the uh, research streams that we are running is the development of a circular economy data observatory. So this is trying to get a handle on data, whether it's public or private data assets, um, to bring them together to support that transition towards circular economy, to help with that transparency um, of material flows, and to really help us, as I mentioned before, provide that evidence base. So using the data that we have to inform the right decisions for business about which circular innovation strategies to implement at, at what point, for example. Mm. Uh, another thing that we have done is launch the Circular Economy Knowledge Hub. So this is a single point of reference for the consolidation of knowledge, not only from the, the NICER programme, but also the wider circular economy community, whether that's in the UK or, or globally. So on the Knowledge Hub, it's a fantastic resource, has lots of different case studies, interviews with practitioners, the latest kind of papers, reports about circular economy um, and what that looks like within different contexts, within different sectors. Um, this report uh, we produced um, last year, looking at how we can accelerate the transition towards circular economy within the NHS. Uh, also, as I mentioned, very focused on innovation and impact. So we have a number of short-term high-impact research projects working with a number of different partners across different sectors. So, for example, just completed some work with John Lewis. Uh, my colleague, Janetta, is um, leading a project with AMDEA, so Association for Manufacturer of um, Domestic Appliances. Uh, as I said, working with the NHS and a number of different partners to really understand what implementation of circular economy looks like uh, on the ground and how we can upscale that. We also, in the hub, have our own um, feasibility studies that we fund. So we've just yesterday actually launched our third round of feasibility study funding. So this is targeted towards early career researchers um, working in, well, or not necessarily working in the area of circular economy, but wanting to apply their research within this area. Um, and so it's kind of, again, seed funding, a maximum of £50,000 over a 12-month project. But, yeah, if, if that is of interest, um, have a look on the website. Um, we also n run a number of clusters. So we have a cluster, so this is kind of working groups on data, policy, and, and human behaviour. And this was a, an initiative that we introduced to really join the dots. I think what we've found is that there's an increasing amount of circular economy activity, but it tends to be quite di sort of, um, disparate and, and not joined up. 
And so we introduced this idea of, of clusters and, and the policy cluster, for example, um, includes representatives from not only the five nicer centres, but also government, devolved administrations and other organisations interested in circular economy policy. And we were really surprised to find that nothing like that existed in government. So now that group is kind of inter, well, nationally recognised and we often get approached by DEFRA and Bayes to consult on, on different ideas around uh, future policy, which is great. We're also doing a lot of work on circular economy roadmap, and I won't say too much about that as there's a workshop later on today where you'll find out all about the work that we're doing in that space. Um, also, developing an inclusive and capable community is really important to us. So recognising that there's lots of activity around circular economy happening, um, it's very diverse um, at all different scales, and one of our key ambitions was to try and provide a voice to all of the different initiatives that are taking place, whether that's at kind of um, regional level or, or national level in businesses, uh, by grassroots organisations. So we've developed um, quite a, a comprehensive uh, communication strategy where we pull in stories. So Imogen is here from the hub and responsible for communicating fantastic stories about all of these different initiatives around the circular economy that are taking place and they're on our knowledge hub as well. We're also really proud to reach out to kind of those communities that might not already be engaged in circular economy activity. I think there's a real risk that you just talk in an echo chamber and you attract kind of the usual suspects. Um, so really happy to be talking to you today about kind of the opportunities that there are um, in the area of circular economy for the foundation industries. So I just put a few links on this last slide to the Knowledge Hub, to um, uh, the, the centre so that you can find out more and, and use some of the research um, and, and the resources that are coming out of the NICER programme. But really happy to, to be here and happy that you uh, are so engaged in this event and I'll be around for the rest of the day if anyone wants to come and have a chat. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, so I know there's a few early career researchers here today as well, so this would be a good opportunity to have a chat with Fiona and her team and, and see if um, the CR&D call that she mentioned might be of interest. And there are businesses here as well. I'm not sure if it's a collaborative type. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's the one to look out for. Um, so our first speaker in our next sort of... Um, oh, sorry, skipped ahead there. Um, in our sort of case study presentation, we've got Sophie Jackson from Circular & Co, who's going to give us an introduction into circular economy strategy for materials. Hi everyone, um, hopefully you can hear me okay and I don't deafen too many people. Um, so um, I'm Sophie Jackson, I'm Head of Circular Economy Strategy at Circular & Co. Um, who are a product design company based in Cornwall, who are helping to champion circular design um, as a key to a sustainable future. Um, so at Circular & Co, we see formerly regarded waste as a resource with untapped potential and are very keen to, uh, to work towards accelerating the circular economy. Um, the circular economy presents a new and exciting approach to material use and a swift diversion away from our existing models of consumption and production, focused on the preservation of Earth's resources through energy and resource efficiency and business model optimization, adaptation and creation. The circular economy presents massive potential benefits for both the economy and the environment. Most importantly, the circular economy presents an opportunity to decouple value creation from resource consumption. So um, the global economy consumes a landmark 100 billion tonnes of material per year, which is crazy. Um, and increasing rates of material use have serious sustainability repercussions. And previous assessments have shown that circular economy strategies can cut global emissions by 39%. In order to create such a transformative impact, circular economy strategies often focus on embedding a life cycle approach to the management of resources, starting at the point of origin, reducing raw material demand, looping resources back into consumption, and instead of extracting further virgin inputs, this can be enabled through innovations relating to material design, 
production and reutilization processes. So a particular key component of the transition to a circular economy involves embedding resource efficiency. Materials should be selected and designed for circulation rather than exploitation and degradation. The clear distinction between a linear and circular economy is abundant when we consider the journey of resources from their extraction to their end of life. Within a linear system, resources are, are extracted from the earth, transformed into products, used, and then discarded as waste. In contrast, within a circular system, waste is avoided and materials are kept at their highest value for as long as possible. It's all about achieving more with less. So moving from a linear to a circular economy involves making sure that we produce sustainably, consume sustainably, and manage and transform our waste into new resources. So in order to enable such a transformation, the circular economy requires the establishment of cross-sector collaboration. Rather than being perceived as a threat to our competitive advantage, this may be reframed as an exciting opportunity to build new collaborative partnerships and blossom new business opportunities. So this is a fundamental paradigm shift in how we do business. Through stimulating and embracing cross-sector collaboration, bringing together new and diverse skill sets, it's possible to create innovative environments for development for, of new solutions to the global challenges we face. Building partnerships and collaboration for the circular economy is all about having the bigger picture in mind, as well as seeing the interconnection across the value chain and a positive impact which may be created through engaging different stakeholders to create innovative solutions. So most recently, Circular & Co demonstrated how effective collaboration can be through a development of the Beach Waste Cup. The cup was developed over the course of last year, a true testament to the importance of collaboration in order to create positive impact in terms of circularity, the environment and community at large. Through collaborating with Matt Hulland, Resource Recovery Manager at Exeter City Council, who coordinated beach cleans, alongside Odyssey Innovation. So here we had multiple perspectives, multiple skill sets, um, aligning and able to enable the transformation of harmful beach waste. Um, and this is plastic that we have polluting our shoreline, particularly we see in Cornwall. Um, and then this was transformed into a valuable material and a beautiful end product. The material was then processed into the sleeve of the cup and manufactured in Cornwall. So key to how we approach the circular economy at Circular Co is the transformation of waste streams into useful, durable products designed for longevity of impact. So taking together multiple perspectives, multiple skill sets, incorporating the community and delivering both social and environmental impact. A transition to the circular economy requires us to rethink how business is positioned within society and the environment and acknowledge its in inherent embeddedness within both society and nature. We need to bolster new circular business models, ones which focus on extending product lifetime, lifetimes. So for example, through resale, remanufacturing, repair or rental, with recycling being the last resort for a truly circular economy. Through the adoption of circular business models, it is possible to get more value out of materials and products. In order to enable the effective and continual circulation of products, new business models and practices must emerge, particularly those which prioritize sharing and access over ownership. Integral to a successful circular economy is the establishment of feedback loops, which enable products and materials to be recirculated. These feedback loops should enable the restoration of technical materials and the regeneration of biological materials. So within nature, feedback loops are inherent as they nourish and continually return value to ecosystems. If we design our economic system to mimic nature, we can create an economy which thrives in harmony with nature. Adopting a circular economy could enable us to re reverse the overshoot of planetary boundaries. Adopting circular materials management is key as this creates and retains more value from less and for longer whilst closing the loop. This is particularly important where extractive and manufacturing industries are concerned, as it is critical that circular strategies are adopted to boost efficiency, harness more from less, and minimize pollution. 
particularly given the importance of these industries to enabling the deployment of large renewable energy infrastructure. Additionally, circular materials management is key to bringing humanity back within the safe planetary limits. And according to the most recent Circle Economy Gap report, we can deliver people's needs with just 70% of the current material demand. So in order to develop a truly circular business, companies must embed circularity at the core of what they do within their operations, enabling them to address global issues while simultaneously enabling profitability. Circularity transition in the broader context requires global shifts, the transition to renewable energy and responsibly resourcing renewable materials with a steady supply. So collaboration will act as a key driver of innovation with a within a circular economy. Such cross-sector collaboration will require us to rethink approaches to managing and coordinating. According to the latest Circularity Gap report, the global economy is now only 7.2% circular, shrinking from 9.1% circularity in 2018. In order to reverse this decline, progress towards heightened circularity, it's essential that we create a collaborative ecosystem. In order to close the loop, Companies cannot work in isolation. Instead, they must actively collaborate and participate in the exchange of knowledge and insights. Achieving circularity requires a fundamental shift in the way business is done and attitudes individuals have around it. But through a successful transition towards circularity, we'll all reap great rewards. For example, through the opportunity for businesses to reduce scarcity concerns and build resilience into business models and supply chains. So what are some key strategies for transitioning towards a circular economy? Firstly, using less materials and energy and ensuring the materials that we do use are used efficiently and for as long as possible. And this may be achieved through designing for durability, repairability, allowing resource flows to be narrowed. Products should be redesigned for access instead of ownership, for example, through incorporating a service model. And next, by phasing out toxic materials and processes and instead substituting them with regenerative resources, which seek to mimic natural cycles, waste limit leakage can be minimized and hopefully eliminated, closing the circular economy loop. And finally, by keeping materials in circulation at their highest value and maximizing the volume of secondary materials, which re-enter the economy. Designing for a circular economy requires fundamentally reframing how we do things and how we think about things but there's no silver bullet, and the transition to a circular economy calls for systems thinking, rejecting siloed thinking, and increasing collaboration. So this is a really exciting space to be in, and every one of you here today has the potential to shape your industry and curve its path towards a circular trajectory. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sophie, for really driving home that message about cross-sector collaboration. Um, and I, I don't know if you brought any of your cups with you. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, well, yeah, we can, we can look at that as a prototype later. Um, so our next speaker, also from Cornwall, uh, will be Lucy Crane from Cornish Lithium. So Lucy, over to you. I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you very much. And I feel like Sophie's talk was the perfect introduction to what part primary extraction industries have to play in a circular economy. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for having me here today. Do I just press it on here? So I wanted to start with this phrase that everything we use is either being grown or mined. And it seems quite basic really um, but I remember my lecturer putting this up on the screen when I was doing when I was doing my master's so I'm a geologist by training and I did master's in mining geology at the Camborne School of Mines and really came into it not knowing much at all about the primary extraction industries just knowing that I like the idea of field work and it really made me think and actually these foundation industries just underpin society as we know it and we've got such a vast opportunity ahead of us to do these in the best possible way and you know Bruce's point right at the start that we need to change these industries if we want to live sustainably is really crucial and that's why I think within the mining industry by adopting these circular economy practices and ways of thinking and trying to design our projects in the best possible way we're going to play a really important role in this energy transition. 
so just some statistics here from a report that stopped. There we go. Maybe I turned it off with my finger. Sorry. Um, there's a report that came out by the IEA a couple of years ago called The Role of Critical Minerals in Green Energy Transitions. And if you're into statistics about the energy transition and quite how mineral intensive it's going to be, that report is fantastic. Um, but, you know, as we're increasing our share of renewable energies, this has got a really big impact on the amount of raw materials that we need to extract to provide that. And actually, as technologies have developed over the last century, decades, we're using way more of the periodic table than we were previously as well. So all of the materials that we need as our populations grow and our technologies develop aren't necessarily in circulation at the moment. So absolutely, we need to be acting stewards of these resources and we need to be designing things for second life applications and designing things so that you can actually recover the raw materials that are in your lithium ion battery in an economically viable way, for example, um, rather than it not being worthwhile at the moment. But for the next decades at least, primary mineral extraction is going to play a really crucial role still. So we, it's really important that we are having these conversations about how we can do it better. So yeah, an onshore wind plant requires nine times more mineral resources than a gas-fired power plant to create the same amount of energy. An electric vehicle has six times the mineral inputs of a traditional combustion engine car. And so we're needing more and more of the periodic table to actually build these low carbon technologies. There are people in here who are much more of an expert on the circular economy than me. But the principles for designing a circular economy, you want to maximize your resource efficiency, you want to minimize your environmental impacts, there are cost savings associated with that, you can provide security of supply, and also as a company, reputationally, it's really important as well. Those are all so directly applicable to the mining industry, and perhaps the mining industry isn't one that necessarily springs to mind when people are thinking about sustainability, and you know, not all parts of the mining industry are doing this very well, but there are some real innovations happening within the industry that I think are fantastic. And all of those reasons and incentives for building a circular economy apply directly to you designing a mineral project. So I think it really is the right time for the industry to be embracing principles of circular economy design. So this is just a diagram I borrowed from a report that I'm sure some of you in the room were involved with a few years ago. Um, looking at securing a technology critical metal supply for the for the UK and you know our global demand for raw materials is set to double by 2060 from what it was a couple of years ago and that is a huge challenge but with every challenge comes an opportunity and so in the mining industry in particular there's a real challenge around how can we actually provide these raw materials in a timely manner so finding a mineral deposit isn't necessarily an easy job. That can take 5, 10, 15 years. And globally, the average amount of time once you've now found your mineral deposit and want to build your mine and bring it into production, globally, the average amount of time there is taking 16 years. And that's because you need to get your environmental permits in place. You need to get a social license to operate. You need to get your mining finance lined up. It's not a small undertaking. And so actually securing that supply of these raw materials is not as straightforward as just finding something and extracting it. There's so many other things that have to line up. And perhaps that um, uncertainty is sometimes missed out of these conversations as well. And, you know, there's geopolitical reasons for us looking to see what we have on our doorstep and perhaps having a more secure supply of these primary foundation industries and their products. And, yeah, I won't go into all of those, but a key thing that I think will help the industry as well is you know mining doesn't necessarily have the best reputation and the younger generation who seem to care rightly so you know climate change and people want to have a job and a career that they feel has a purpose and can make a positive impact on the world mining isn't necessarily the industry that comes straight to mind um, and so we need to change the image of the industry because we need people who care about the environment and who care about doing things well to actually come into these foundation industries because that's where they can have a real impact. So that's kind of setting the scene slightly. So for the next couple of minutes, I thought we could look at what we're doing at Cornish Lithium, trying to build these circular economy principles into our, you know, what we're actually doing down in Cornwall. So to introduce Cornish Lithium, we are looking for lithium in Cornwall. 
And that's because lithium is used a lot in batteries and electric vehicles and this global demand for it has really shot up. And we are a company of nearly 65 people now based down in Cornwall. It's a private company and we're looking at lithium contained within two different geological settings. So underneath Southwest England, if any of you ever watch a Beyond Exeter and drive down the A30, you go over Dartmoor, then Bodmin, and basically all of the topographic highs are where we've got these big outcrops of granite at the surface, but it's all joined up at depth, all the way out to Land's End, and actually the Isles of Scilly as well. And um, the granite in Cornwall is relatively enriched in lithium compared to other granites around the world, and it's also fairly hot, which is why we've got the potential for geothermal energy. So certain pockets of that granite are more enriched in lithium than others. So we've got one project where we're looking at repurposing an old china clay pit and now producing lithium from it. And then we're also looking at the potential to produce lithium from geothermal waters. So I'll go into those in a bit more detail in a moment. There's quite a lot happening down in Cornwall around the circular economy. And actually, the Metpotec Circular Economy Centre that Fiona introduced a minute ago. We've got Eva Marcus here, who can tell you in about it in much more detail than I can. But Cornish Lithium is actually a delivery partner, or a kind of supporting partner of this initiative. Um, it's led by Professor Francis Wall, who's based at the Camborne School of Mines. Um, we actually have an office that's over the road <laughs> from CSM. So it's brilliant. And you know, it seems to be a fantastic way of collaborating with industry, using best practice, and it's coming out of all of the research in the Circular Economy Centre, and helping to implement, implement well, if I could speak, <laughs> helping to actually implement these ideas in real time and in businesses as we're all looking to develop. Um, Cornish Lithium is also a partner on a project that's just kicking off now. Um, so this is Faraday Batch Challenge Round 5 and it's a project called Reblend. So it's looking at what we're doing as part of this is providing primary materials that have lithium in them. And then the project's going to see whether we can apply some of the lithium extraction processes, technologies to extract lithium from not only secondary sources, but also from primary sources, because there just seems to be some synergy there. If we're going to be extracting lithium from primary sources and we're going to be extracting lithium from secondary sources, does it make sense to join them up at some point or co-design them? Um, so this is just kicking off. I haven't been that involved in it, but um, it looks like it's going to be a really interesting project. And we're going to be working with Minviro as well, who are going to be doing life cycle assessments to actually look at what those benefits could actually be and quantify them. So moving swiftly on, because I've been just about to go over my time, just a bit of information about our projects. So the Trelava project is an old china clay pit. So in central Cornwall around St. Austell, um, china clay extraction has been happening for just over 275 years. And it actually looks a bit like green if you look at it on Google Earth. And that's because there's these big white open pits where people have been extracting kaolin for, well, yeah, nearly 300 years. So we're looking to repurpose an old pit. And there's also a lot of infrastructure in the area. So kaolin production has been declining for the last decade or so. And actually, there's a lot of infrastructure that's perhaps slightly underutilized that we might be able to make the most of. So circular economy design in that it's an existing pit that we want to repurpose. There's existing industrial sites that, again, we want to repurpose and build our processing sites on. And there's infrastructure already in place. So for example, you can see that purple line is a railway that goes to the port, but also joins up to the main line. This seems to make so much more sense than building a new open pit in the middle of Cornwall. And actually, I don't know we would ever get community support for that. We're also looking at being as efficient with our resource as we possibly can. So we're looking to produce, or we're going to be using the technology that's been developed by a group in Australia called Lepidico. And what that allows us to do is produce a battery grade lithium hydroxide product on site. So a lot of the time in the lithium production world, you'll produce a mineral concentrate on site, but ship it somewhere else, normally China, to refine it into something that's a high enough purity to be able to be used as a, you know, a cathode precursor. This technology allows us to do that on site, and we'll also have a number of byproducts that we're looking to produce. So cesium, potash, rubidium, for example. 
We'll also have an amorphous silica product that we're in discussions about maybe using in marine concrete, for example. We'll also have from the first stage, the kind of physical processing stage where we just separate out the lithium minerals from the rest of the rock, potential aggregate products as well. We want to minimize our waste as far as possible because there's environmental reasons for us not having to dispose of it. There's also economic reasons for us not having to pay to dispose of it. And actually some of these things might have value. So I actually think it's quite exciting. So we're really trying to minimize our waste as far as possible. And then we're also looking at how can we actually trace that and verify that. So we're looking at using blockchain technology to actually trace from the mine all the way through to inclusion in a battery, for example. And car manufacturers seem to be wanting that. And then just to finish, oh, sorry, I've got two more slides. Um, just to highlight a project that we actually did with TFI funding. And this was called the Click Project. Very catchy title. So this was the co-production of lithium and china clay in Cornwall. And this was actually in conjunction with Paris and a group called HSSMI. So there are lithium minerals in the granite rock. And as you extract kaolin, you're actually concentrating up those, potentially concentrating up those lithium rich minerals in the waste products. And there are lots of waste tips dotted all around the St. Austell area that could have decent lithium potential. They've already been mined, they've already been crushed and they're at, they're at surface. So the Click project went around and evaluated the potential to perhaps produce lithium from these legacy waste streams that are in the area, but also looked at the kind of current waste streams that are being produced both by Imaris, but also could we also produce kaolin from our future waste streams. So it's a really interesting project and I think we're hoping to follow up on that. And then finally, we're also looking to produce lithium from We've got these lithium rich granites in the whole of southwest England. There are naturally existing cracks in the rock. They've been there for you know, hundreds of millions of years. And deep groundwaters, geothermal waters circulating within them. And we believe they've effectively leached the lithium from the granite and into the water. So what we aim to do is put boreholes on the surface down into these geological faults, pump the water up to the top, there's new technology that exists that allows you to just remove your lithium ions from the water. And then actually we look to just re-inject those lithium depleted waters back down into the geological system so they can heat up again, recharge with lithium. We're looking to drill down to one, two kilometers depth and water will be about 70 to 80 degrees C. So if we're pumping up warm waters, it makes sense to see if we can use that heat as well. So we're looking to partner with local businesses, industry, or perhaps set up district heating schemes as well to use, use that water. And in parallel, we're seeing if there's anything else that we could perhaps recover from the water as well. But that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour on Cornish Lithium. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Lucy, for sharing all of that um, activity that's happening down in Cornwall. And I really agree with your message there that we need to change the image of the industry, mining, foundation industry, both alike. Um, and part of this event is really to, to market those industries to early career researchers. You know, this, these are huge, huge industries that need you as a next generation of thinkers um, to innovate. So there, you know, likewise, the businesses as well, you've got lots of centers here based around the country as well for you to tap into to, to find those um, new innovators. So our next speaker, Sarah Howard from Circular Ceramics. Hey everyone, um, thanks for inviting me to speak and talk about my practice, which is called Circular Ceramics. And I define it as an industrial symbiosis around the ceramics industry, whereby the byproducts from external industries that would otherwise go to landfill replace the virgin raw materials in ceramic production. So this is a practice that I developed um, studying ceramic design in my final year. And since then, which that started in 2020, since then, I've just been implementing it globally. And I haven't spoken to a non ceramicist audience before, so I thought I'd give you an introduction to the materials that make up ceramics, which is present in more places than you might think. It could be in the brakes in your cars, tiling, cladding, um, you name it, probably sanitary wear. Um, and it's mainly composed of the clay body, um, which is normally from materials like china clay, ball clay, different aluminas and silicas. And then in order to make the ceramics 
food safe and the surface vitrified, it normally has a glaze on it. And that's made up of three main components. You have the silica, which is the glass former, the flux, which is the melting agent to bring down the silica has a very high melting temperature, so the flux is introduced so that it melts. And then you've got the alumina, which again is the china clay, ball clays, um, that stiffen the glaze. And ad in addition to that, you also have the colouring oxides, um, and this is what brings the different speckles, a range of shades, um, to ceramics. And normally ceramics are fired to around stoneware temperatures, which is 1260 to 1300 degrees Celsius. And there is this perception from the wider audience, like the general public, that ceramics isn't an impactful industry compared to others. Um, I try to demyth that and remind people about where the materials that we consume come from. And that's mainly from the mining and pouring industry. Uh, this is uh, a copper mine in Spain. It's the largest one in Europe. And as consumers of like copper in the ceramics industry, we use it as a colouring oxide. Um, we kind of are very distant from where our materials come from. Um, people who buy it online get it bagged up in a plastic bag, delivered to their studio or manufacturing site, uh, have little, little knowledge known about the origin and journey that it went on before it got there. Because we often think about waste within the production itself, but not what happens before. So I'm sure Lucy knows much more about this <laughs> than I do. Um, but from my research uh, and looking at the effects of extraction, um, you've got the energy and water. A lot of it relies on fossil, uh, burning fossil fuels. Um, although I know that there's a transition towards electrifying mines. And then you've got the tailings, which Lucy already spoke about, so I'm kind of repeating, but talking about St. Austell's China clay quarries, uh, nine tons of waste is produced for every ton of clay quarried. You've also got copper mines like the image before, where uh, it's estimated that to extract 20 million tons of copper ore, we need to uh, remove 2 billion tons of rock. You've got the toxic residues, that's uh, the toxic slurries, which are acidic and leach into uh, our soils and waterways. Transportation, which is another thing Lucy spoke about in terms of once it's extracted, some materials are transported to China to be further purified before then being distributed to the manufacturing site. So um, that's probably the part of the mining industry, correct me if I'm wrong, that has a bigger CO2 impact associated potentially. We can argue that later. Um, <laughs> You've also got the impact to local businesses um, and the displacement of communities. Often, uh, in, in some cases, they can't live to the same quality that they did before in a new location. You've got health implications for the community as well. Uh, in Yuri, Kashmir, where gypsum is mined, that's, where, uh, that's what we use to create our plaster molds in production. Um, the dust from extraction negatively impacts the locals that reside there, causing a number of chest-related disorders and polluting the river Julem that runs through the village. Uh, and then you've also got child labour associated with some of the minerals that we consume in ceramics. The most well-known is probably cobalt, um, which where 90% is mined in the DRC. And although ceramic material suppliers will say that their cobalt is ethically sourced, pretty hard to know if that's the case or not, because you've got the LSM, the large scale mining, and artisanal mining. All the ores are being processed in the same site before being extracted, so um, that is arguable. Uh, and then um, this is um, some data extracted from Fairphone, the Fair Material Sourcing Map. For me, as a ceramist, it's quite hard to access information about the materials that we use, um, but I like the way that they break down the social challenges, environmental challenges, the demand for depletion within the, with the materials that we use. So these are some of the materials that we use in our production. Um, materials like zinc um, are expected to run out in 100 years based on current rates of consumption. Um, there's other materials as well that are more scarce, but uh, it's it's said that it's not they're not essentially going to run out, but the cost is either going to go up, and zinc might be a mineral that is just too costly for ceramic production and would have to transition to other materials. Um, or to extract smaller deposits, it's going to have a greater ecological and potentially social impact in doing so. And so when I first looked at how we can improve the ceramics industry, um, ideally I was thinking we could just get a ceramic plate, 
take it back and show it's 13 raw materials and start again. Um, but I've thought about it a lot and I don't think it's possible. So I looked at the potential of an industrial symbiosis, working with other industries, um, how could they can replace the otherwise mined or quarried minerals within ceramic production, um, and we can eliminate a lot of the impact in ceramic production by doing so. And when I began, I started working with the stone industry, the glass industry, and the construction industry. They're all industries that deal with the same virgin raw materials that we would in ceramics. Um, I went to the manufacturing sites, mapped out their waste streams, and looked at the materials that were going to landfill. Um, these were often slurries that couldn't be recycled within um, their own industries. Um, but I made sure to ignore any materials that were being continually recycled within that industry. So an example of that would be the offcuts of glass, which can be continually melted down without losing purity. Um, and the next stage was taking these materials, uh, carrying out lots of research um, and development tests to figure out how to process it in a way that it could be used for ceramic production and then uh, substituted in replacement for those typically virgin raw materials. So this is construction stone and glass. That's how they're sourced. This is the, the how they're reclaimed. So both the stone and glass are slurried and then they're all processed into a dry powder because that's how we weigh up our ingredients for production. And since then, it's expanded a little bit. I'm working with the metal industry as well. We're wait working with the plast molds from production and also F&B waste, so all the um, shells as a source of calcium carbonate. And in 2020, um, I had a ceramic collection come out. It's made from 100% industrial waste. And I was making this in my studio. I was reclaiming all the waste materials locally. But ultimately, I knew that by doing this, I wasn't really making much of a difference. I was making more stuff that no one needed. So the goal from here, the next step, was to scale up and work with existing manufacturers, implement the industrial waste on a larger scale. Uh, and so that's what I did. Uh, last year, I moved to Indonesia to work with a manufacturer called Kavala. And this isn't mass, mass manufacturing. I just call it mass manufacturing. Um, so everything is still handmade. We haven't got any machines that um, produce the vessels. Um, and I was hoping to copy and paste the model that I made in London. And, uh, but obviously, it wasn't that easy. The, I learned about the different cultural attitudes towards waste and how something that is waste in the UK has value somewhere else. And I was located in an area that didn't have any recycling facilities on the island whatsoever. There was four destinations for waste. It was either going to landfill, it was either being dumped in the rivers and ultimately ending up in the ocean, or, um, or it's getting burnt, um, or it gets exported to another, the mainland to be recycled. And I was there at the time when the war started, petrol prices went up, um, companies could no, were no longer making profit from exporting waste um, to the mainland um, as the material didn't have enough value. And so one of the waste streams, oh wait, this is the collection that I, I have coming out this year. It's made from 75% to 100% waste. Um, so for example, like the glass slurry that we'd collect from the UK, um, that industrial machine just didn't exist on the island, so we didn't have that waste stream. And so I've worked, oh, there's an NGO that placed um, barriers in the rivers to collect all the consumer waste dumped in there. Um, and we brought back the glass waste and cleaned it, broke it down, and that became a silicon component in the, this glaze. And this is also working with the stone industry again and working with the waste within our own production. So we reclaimed a lot of the materials from the water waste treatment system at the factory. And uh, lastly, so I work with factories mainly, and um, I also have a book that came out in 2020, but recently updated, new ones coming out soon. But this update, uh, this outlines all my methods of sourcing, um, processing, and substituting the waste materials into ceramic production. So this is mainly aimed at small-scale producers or studio potters, um, and it's released under the Creative Commons license, um, share alike. So everything can be, anyone can use it and use the materials commercially. Um, they just have to uh, credit. But the goal is that, that I 
keep any solutions to myself and that it becomes widely known and widely implemented and that's something that I strong stand strongly by. Um, I might get criticised for it <laughs> in some cases, but I think it's something, and it's been mentioned before by the other speakers, the importance of sharing the knowledge and working together as industries to, to implement it because we don't have enough time to, to keep these solutions to ourselves. Um, thanks for listening. That's it. Sonia, Sonia, there you are. <laughs> no, Sonia Peacock is from DS Smith, so I'll hand over to you. Hi everyone, um, it's lovely to be here today. I'm Sonia and I work at DS Smith. Um, I work in their sustainability team and um, I'm also informally an appointed brand ambassador for Circular Co. <laughs> That's a joke really, but I just really love their mugs and I brought mine today. <laughs> So, let's see, is it going? Yeah. So, um, I'll tell you a little bit about DS Smith, our purpose, our business model, and how we incorporate sustainability, um, and how we also design for the circular economy, um, followed by a couple of case studies, um, if we if we have time. Um, so, a little bit about us. I have to admit, we're not an SME, and. Um, Actually, we're really not an SME. I think we began as an SME in the 1940s and um, when we started out making boxes in London, but since then we have expanded uh, quite signific significantly and uh, we operate across Europe and North America. Um, we've got quite a lot of employees and um, we are now a leading provider of sustainable packaging solutions and we really champion the circular economy. So um, I'm quite excited to tell you how we do that. Um, so I think we all know that the world around us is absolutely changing and we recognize that too at DS Smith. Um, I always wanted to work in sustainability ever since I was at school and through all my degrees um, and also throughout before working at DS Smith. Um, and as a consumer myself, I am quite critical of, of brands and I want to see them doing more um, like the other speakers, speakers here today. And we expect more of the brands and the products and the services that we buy. And at DSP, we really recognize that, um, which is why um, leading the way in sustainability is one of our big strategic goals. And that's why, um, well, I suppose that's why I have a job at DS Smith. So I'm quite grateful that they think so too. <laughs> um, our circular business model, um, I'm, I'm really happy to tell you a bit about this. So um, we've got three main services at DS Smith. We've got a packaging um, department or a packaging division, so we create packaging there. Uh, we've got a paper division, so we've got about 16 paper mills. And then we've also got um, a division of recycling. And so um, we create the paper at our paper mills, as you can probably imagine. This gets sent to our packaging departments, our packaging um, sites, where we create packaging for our, our customers. And then that's used by customers or consumers. Then we take it to our recycling depots, where we recycle it into new packaging, goes to the paper mills, made into new paper, then packaging, then used, then recycled. So it goes around and around. And, um, what a, a, an impressive statistic is, is that the, the fibers in our packaging can be recycled up to 25 times, um, which, is, which is more than I would have imagined. So that number really stuck to my brain. And it's really in our interest to keep the fibers in use as long as possible. Not only because obviously it's economically makes sense for us to keep them in use for as long as possible, but it's also the most environmentally friendly option. Um, and for our boxes and packaging solutions, um, I think over 90, percent of our feedstock is recycled feedstock so um, we we don't use a lot of virgin material but as you can imagine if the fibers get shorter and shorter and shorter per every time they go around we do have to inject a small amount of virgin fiber to keep the um, packaging in in the loop so we have a couple of forests as well and um, that injects a little bit of virgin we really do want our boxes to be recycled and recyclable and made of recycled content as much as possible and that is the case um, so 
stepping back slightly, um, we've got a sustainability strategy which is very much focused on the circular economy too, um, which was developed in um, partnership with the Ellen McCartney Foundation. Um, and, and when I joined DS Smith, I was really fangirling the fact that we were a strategic partner with the EMF because I've always, always loved the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So that was, that was a big reason why I wanted to join uh, DS Smith. So they helped us develop our sustainability strategy. And um, the two biggest pillars of the strategy are, are climate action and, and uh, embedding the circular economy as best as we can. And even though we, we do a good job, I think, at DS Smith, there are always... Um, there's always more to be done, and I think everyone knows that. Um, so a few of our KPIs for, th for the circular economy um, that I wanted to point out is one, um, by 2023, we'll manufacture 100% reusable or recyclable packaging. And um, actually, last year, that was achieved. So over 99.7% now of our packaging is recyclable or reusable. So that's, that's quite a good statist statistic. Um, that by 2025, we'll take one billion pieces of problem plastics off the supermarket shelves. Um, I think last year we were at 313 million pieces. So essentially working with uh, our customers on finding plastics and saying, how can we find recyclable alternatives to that? And then um, the last one being engaging 100% of our people on the circular economy. And uh, we actually send quite a few of them through the University of Exeter Circular Economy Masterclass, which is brilliant, so they really like that too. Um, okay, so now looking a little bit more at how we design for the circular economy. Um, we know that our customers, we, they really need to embed more circular packaging, and we want to help them to do that, which is how and why we have Circular Ready as a key growth area. Um, so how do we do that? So we've got our circular design principles, um, they were developed a couple of years ago, and they're essentially a set of principles to guide our design and innovation community. Um, so we, we try and help them to think, you know, how, how can we look at packaging and how can we make it more sustainable? How can we, can, how can we design it for a circular economy? Um, so these are sort of the six main principles. We've got protecting the products. So if we've got packaging and products inside, if the products break, that creates waste, and waste is a part of the linear economy. So first and foremost, we want to make sure that our packaging does its job and protects the products inside it. Um, then we try and optimize the material and structure. So how do we use as little fiber as possible to get the job done? We don't want to use any more materials than absolutely necessary to create our packaging solutions. Um, and then how do we, how do we have um, packaging solutions that are fully recyclable so that we can keep them in the use in the in the loop for as long as possible. Um, how can we create packaging options that um, maximize supply chains? So how can we design it so that they fit together succinctly on a pallet and we send less pallets um, on lorries or, or shipping? And then how do we find a better way? So how can we think outside the box um, to find the best solutions possible? And we've also got our circular design metrics so if we say to customers you know we, we really want to look at your current packaging options and then measure them so across a variety or eight different sustainability indicators to see how they rank how can we then look at that and improve upon them so um, a few of our different metrics are um, is the is the recycle is the solution 100% recyclable or how can we make it become 100% recyclable is it made of a renewable resource? Um, what percentage of recycled content does it currently have? Um, is it designed for reuse, or is it just designed to be a single use item? Um, and is it planet safe? Are we using materials in that packaging option that are, you know, are planet safe and not causing pollution? Um, and then I've got a few case studies. Um, so. This one really made me quite happy. I spoke to our general manager in Launceston uh, the other day, and he was telling me about um, an option that they're looking at. So this is quite a pilot phase at the minute, um, but it's about how to make um, vases that are being transported for, for flowers. So currently the solution is they've got a um, fine flute vase and PET wrap filled um, sort of bouquet in a corrugated box. And what they're looking at is creating a waterproof corrugated 
pack, which reduces all the need for plastics. And they are also looking at how they then pick up the, uh, the corrugated vase um, through a subscription service, so then they reuse it and re-deliver it again in the future. Um, and I'm not going to lie, reuse for our industry is quite challenging. We really are recycling focused. Um, and with all the legislation coming through and, and the demand from consumers, reuse is kind of like, we're, we're doing some, but it's a bit scary, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, so when I see things like this, it makes me really proud that we are trying to find reuse options as well. Um, and I think this is really exciting. So I was, I was really pleased that he showed me this. Um, another one from Gloucester, we've got, um, this was a closed loop solution. So um, they were looking at how they could have a wine box um, that essentially it's made in our, in our boxes and then um, into our site in Gloucester. And then it's used by um, our customer at Lathwaite's. And when they flat pack it, then it's taken back to our recycling center, made into new boxes right there and then, and then sent back to Lathwaite's. So they know that the content is being kept in the loop and are very, very local as well. Um, and I don't think I've mentioned this before, but um, with our box to box solution, it actually, a box can be made recycled, made into new paper, then packaging in just 14 days. So, I mean, I'd, I'd love to co go with a box on that journey. Maybe I could spend my holiday with it. <laughs> um, and then a final one um, is uh, looking at um, some of these energy balls for, for birds. Um, and they originally had these round um, plastic boxes for the energy balls. And they didn't really fit very well on a pallet together because, I mean, round circular things don't, well, I mean, circular economy is different, but circular packaging so that don't really fit together very well. And there's a lot of empty space. Um, so we found a recyclable option that was uh, square. They all stuck together really well, which meant that we could increase the packaging uh, on the pallet by 50% and removed 100 tons of plastic from their supply chain. Um, so there's a lot of good work being done, but of course, at Dear Smith, I really hope that we have more case studies and more exciting examples to share, which I'm sure we will. So that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sonia. Always good to have um, an insight into what big companies are doing as well and you know, making a national impact. Um, our final speaker couldn't make it today, actually, which would have led on quite nicely into sort of the plastic packaging and um, waste reuse there, but she couldn't be here today. So we, we've got some time now to do Q&A. Um, so does anyone have any questions for our speakers? And I'll just check if we've got anyone online who's got some questions. Um, but I've got a quick one um, for, for Sonia. Um, so you mentioned, obviously, reuse is really difficult for packaging paper. Um, you know, I, I'd agree with that. But would you say that part of the problem lies with the consumer, because a lot of this packaging, once it's with the consumer, like you know, w is it about educating them on how they could reuse it? Because it, it, I feel like not all of the responsibility would be on the packaging designer, right? I don't know if the definition of reuse that they use <laughs> is that it's got to be reused for the same purpose. So we often find ways for packaging to be reused. So, I mean, we've, we've done a funny one on like um, Halloween costumes made of your cardboard boxes. I will, not just joking, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is quite fun. Um, but I think it's, a, it's got to be a system change. Um, so obviously DS Smith is set up so that we are fully there for the recycled, uh, re for recycling our packaging into new, new solutions, but for reuse, um, it's it is a much more challenging thing because people do like to keep their boxes back and people have attics full of boxes or if you have an allotment like me, you like to put it on the ground because it, it puts the weeds, you know, it keeps the weeds away um, and, and trying to get it back to to us at DS Smith, that is that is really challenging. So we're exploring that and um, I'm really, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see where it's going to go soon. Okay. Amazing. Um, any other questions for any of our speakers? Uh, thanks very much. My question is for Sarah. Hey, uh, 
I wanted to ask um, your experience with the support out there for people doing Creative Commons sharing. It's very, very brave. I think it's really inspiring, but you create disproportionate impact. You can probably monetize your own solution slightly less or it's slightly more difficult to. Uh, and I think we need to support that as, a, as an ecosystem. Um, what's your experience been with it and what can we do more to support that kind of uh, entrepreneurship? Hi, um, it's definitely challenging. Um, I've like had my experience with it not being followed, um, which is challenging when it's like when I'm early on in my work and I'm less established. So uh, it's it's more emotional than <laughs> like damaging to like what I do, and I don't really have like any other business model by another company or designer that follows it in a way that I can replicate my model and ensure that I, I keep myself safe, but it feels completely wrong to like put a pattern on it and protect it. Uh, it just counteracts everything that I'm trying to achieve. So I'm stubborn in keeping it that way and figuring out how by working with manufacturers, I can still have an income and, and also have like a book, um, which isn't necessarily an income, but it, um, it kind of puts my standpoint on it and for me it's like the more well known it is then that sort of protects myself um but at the end of the day i just think if someone else is copying it and not crediting at least they're doing it so like, um, yeah it benefits the planet more than the, yeah but I, I don't really know what i'm doing <laughs> figuring out on the way yeah what the best way to do it is Hi, it's probably more of a comment than a question, and I just love how enthusiastic everyone is about what we've been talking about, so thank you. Um, I come from a commodity metal, so steel background, and obviously when we're talking about cardboard boxes and you using them in your allotment, for example, but having that subscription service about being able to get the material back to the manufacturer, I think there's, there's a huge part that needs to be played on the supply chain management of how we actually, almost as though we need to break the model that's currently in place so that we can stop materials going into either automatically being remelted to make more materials or just lost within the supply chain. I don't know if anybody could comment on, on good practice and that sort of thing that we could we could implement. I know we, you talked about sort of blockchain and, and following the materials through, but it's just one of the biggest issues that we have in, in, in moving that forward and creating a circular economy in that area. As I say, more of a comment. <laughs> If someone could solve it, that'd be great. Thanks. Hi, just a quick question for Sonia on the um, recycling of fibres. You're saying that it only goes through about 25 times. How do you, talking about tracking and tracing, how do you monitor that so that, do you, can you just tell by the length of the fibre or? labs for example um one in Kemsley, they've got a, a really great um lab um and they, they they do they have really quite extensive research uh machinery to assess the length of fibers and they run tests and they've got a whole like the whole ds smith packaging loop but resynthesized into little machines um so they run quite a lot of tests there to see you know how how many times the um fibers can go through and and at what length and what the strength is and the quality of the of of each i suppose but also industry standards so there's a lot of there's a lot of research that we also feed into through like fefco and cpi and stuff mine's actually a question for sophie and sarah um, how do you deal with the challenge, and sorry, you kind of touched on it with going out to Indonesia, the kind of heterogeneity of these waste streams, because if you're designing products made from waste, how do you deal with the fact that you might not have control over those waste streams and exactly what the plastics are or the fact that people might not actually be collecting anything? Because surely that's one of the big challenges for actually scaling up businesses like that. I mean, that's one of the kind of main areas is at the moment 
we have so many people that are reaching out to us who are collecting waste through loads of different kind of um, community interest groups and social groups and it's kind of that all of a sudden influx of new materials and it's knowing how best to harness them and where they're like most applicable um, and that's definitely a challenge that we're facing as a company when there are so many different people with kind of the best interest at heart and I've spoken to some people um, from different kind of community interest groups who are collecting so much waste and they're kind of storing it in their homes and whatnot they don't actually know how to reprocess it all and that's kind of where we need to be forming these kind of collaborative partnerships so we can have both industry producing beautiful products but also having the people with technical expertise actually to kind of find ways of harnessing this waste and stopping it from being waste and instead a resource and for the ceramics industry um, mitigating the waste was like the first thing I spoke about like I, I thought about when working with waste materials and a lot of that is solved just by having a good relationship with the material waste material supplier having really good communication about any changes in the material before you consume it and working in being an industry that consumes virgin raw materials a lot of the time deposits will run out and um, we'll get the same material but from a different mine and in a factory setting, then we have to run a series of tests to ensure it behaves in the same way before we put it into production. And so actually, there's almost more, there are equally variables when working with virgin raw materials in itself um, and in terms of like the depletion and not having a consistent supply. So in some ways, having a more local waste source and that you can have better communication with any changes um, sometimes cancels it out but not always yeah it is still a struggle to keep it consistent time for a um, couple more yeah thank you this question uh, is for sonia mainly i guess uh, in the, in the when you manufacture materials like packaging especially ones that have to be grease proof or waterproof like the, the like the flour containers you're faced with the uh, challenge that paper cardboard isn't waterproof and so one of the solutions is to put a plastic coating <laughs> on it. So this raises one of the main problems of the circular economy is irreversible processes. What are you guys doing to avoid doing irreversible things to your materials so that they can't be, that are very difficult to, to separate later? That's a great question. Um, we have um, a, almost like a department that looks into barriers and coatings. Um, and I think in in the past we did use plastics, but I think more and more we're not. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to lie, it's not my area of expertise. So um, we do use wax coatings and other, some of them are, are I think, biodegradable and organic. Um, but it is it is one of those things that is, it is challenging. And I think we try and get as possible and also when they are reprocessed we do manage to pull them out again and then still recycle the paper um, we also have uh, something called eco bowl and that's got a plastic it's almost like a plastic tray within the cardboard so you can separate it out and, and recycle it properly um, so that is something that they're looking at more and more um, but I do know uh, we do we can recycle um, packaging with a thin layer of plastic on the in outside but just not on the outside too. So that's something I didn't know. So coffee cups, we can technically recycle those. They've got um, plastic on the inside layer. Um, but on the outside, if it's uh, for, for cold drinks, you can't, can't recycle those. So um, there, is, there is some detail in there that I'm not completely certain of, and it's a mystery to me too. But I, uh, maybe if I become a laminates director, I will, I'll be able to tell you more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, this question goes to, it's actually quite similar to the previous question, goes to Sonia. Um, so in one of your examples, one of the case studies you cited, um, so you've got the the boxes, the wine boxes in sort of in permanent loop. Um, I don't know whether you've looked into sort of comparing that. How does that compare with using virgin materials? Sort of uh, in terms of, um, so of course, there would be other resources in, in place in order to get them because you are recycling them rather than reusing them. So, in terms of cost and material efficiency and everything else, how does that compare with using virgin materials? Oh, I think um, if 
we're looking at virgin uh, materials versus recycled content, um, it's it's really difficult to measure sort of the differences. I know that we have done some work on it before. Um, recycled content we found to be better than using sort of craft um, in terms of its environmental footprint, mostly because we're trying to keep it in the loop for as long as possible. Um, the carbon footprint, I think, I'll have to look at the fact sheet, but I'm quite sure it's better <laughs> as well, um, usually. But for, for hmm. it's, it's a great question. I'm not well rehearsed on it enough, to be honest, but. Um, so, so it, it, it ex exactly because there are there are so yeah so the environmental sort of box to tick there's the ecological there is the economic and financial and all of that I'm sure what they're about it's probably winning on the environmental side but with the other areas um, like economically economic, I economic, think it makes sense for I mean it's definitely more viable for us economically to use recycled content because otherwise when you have to source virgin material from from forests which is expensive and, and, and we don't own the forests oftentimes, um, whereas we have much more control over the recycled content because we're Europe's biggest recycler of corrugated packaging. So we have a lot of, we have a lot of stock coming in. So that's good. Um, so economically, yes, it is, it is better. Excellent, thank you. thank you. Hi, um, I have a question for Sarah, actually. I'm quite interested in kind of industrial cl clay waste you can use in your ceramics. Um, I work in the board clay industry and one of our challenges is that some of our clays are too high in iron. Um, so our customers don't want them because they don't buy a white. Um, they have these impurities in them. So is that something which you can utilize in your product? Or? Definitely factories are more um, picky about the materials that they consume. I know that smaller scale producers would be very open to working with slightly contaminated materials. Like that's no problem at all. Usually uh, I set up an initiative last year, which is called Golden Air Studio. I work with a property developer. So every time he has an excavation uh, at a site, uh, we then, instead of that clay going to landfill or being uh, transported somewhere in the UK, we then distribute it to ceramicists or artists or makers, anyone who wants it. Um, but that, that's currently the only source that I have for clays. Um, but we have the wastewater treatment system at the factory that collects all the clay uh, residue um, that we use to make a new clay body. Um, but I think that it's definitely worth exploring if we can establish uh, a flow of waste to, yeah, to the ceramics end. Sure. Thank you. Hello, hi, my name is Vin. Uh, my question is open for all, and it's a follow-up of Khalid's question. In terms of when we say of impacts, uh, economic, environmental, is really at the forefront. Um, just wanted to ask, like, in terms of social impacts, what has been the experience or, you know, the main highlights that have been coming across as part of this transition journey, other than the workforce training and development for the business model design? Like, what other impacts have been evident as, you know, the part of the transition? I can answer it from a mining perspective. And in the mining industry, we talk about a thing called social license to operate, which is kind of intangible and you can't measure it, but you know when you've got it and you know when you don't. And it's basically the support of local communities for you actually building a project on their doorstep. And I think a big part of our offering to the communities where we're looking to establish projects is actually we are trying to do this very differently to how you might think of mining. And a big part of that is actually through our efforts to, well, with the Hard Rock Project, minimize waste as far as possible, re be as resource efficient as far as possible. You know, we want to have an electric mining fleet, for example. We're looking at other renewable, you know, we want to power our processing plants with 100% renewable energy. And I think that's all part of our offering to, you know, to the local community, being good neighbors and them actually hopefully having some benefit from us being there. And the same with the geothermal projects. You know, it's very different how people think of mining because actually there's very little to no waste produced from it. We're just removing the lithium ions from the water and hoping to use the heat that it contains before re-injecting it back down. And so, yeah, from a kind of primary extraction perspective, I think it's a really key part of us gaining the trust and keeping the trust of the communities where we're looking to set up these projects. Yeah, 
I mean, um, we're obviously producing products for consumers and getting people to kind of buy into the idea is key to selling products. But for example, um, we're currently trialing the development of deposit return schemes. Um, we're working with various partners um, from kind of like hubs, for example, in Bristol um, and looking at kind of working with transport networks um, to kind of introduce a new new model for more circular sustainable consumption. So it's not always possible to remember to bring your reusable cup um, and then due to convenience you often end up buying a single use cup just because we're on the go, we're on the rush. Um, but if there are these kind of options for a deposit return scheme cup where you can still have a convenient drink but then instead of having to buy into single use you can then just kind of return it at the store or at a drop-off point you can still participate in the circular economy without um, it being an inconvenience. And that's kind of somewhere that we're getting a lot of support um, because lots of people really do want to support the circular economy. It's just knowing how they can um, on an individual level. Yeah, exactly. Um, I spent three months working in Munich and that was one thing. It's just like second nature. I mean, with the font system, with everyone with their um, returning their bottles and whatnot. I mean, you're incentivized to do so, but it's definitely kind of part of the culture there and it's just kind of changing consumer habits in the UK. But yeah. Thank you. Um, it's a question for Lucy. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed learning about uh, Cornish Lithium. Um, so on one of your slides, you showed how circular economy is achieved for the industry and actually mining industry is going into somewhat linear way into the loop and so I wonder what do you think are the radical changes that need to happen in the industry to facilitate circularity uh, what kind of business models might need to be adopted so in my mind I'm thinking material material service system um, or mining uh, in a different way um, urban mining perhaps. Uh, I wonder what are those radical radical changes? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question because primary extraction is kind of eventually what we're trying to design out with a circular economy, right? We want to get rid of raw material inputs as far as possible. So I think there's kind of two ways of approaching it. One is, okay, as the primary extraction industry at the moment, you know, for the next few decades at least, as we go through this energy transition, it's going to be so mineral intensive that we need to apply circular principles, I think, to individual projects to try and make them as efficient and resource efficient as possible. So, you know, what byproducts can you produce alongside it? How can we minimize our waste as far as possible? How can we be as efficient with that resource and have the smallest footprint yet still providing the raw materials that we need? But absolutely, when it comes to looking at the whole system, we need a huge change. So, um, you know, things like a lithium ion battery, when you recycle, and this is not my area of expertise, but what I understand is that when you recycle a lithium ion battery, you get a black mass, and you know, that's got a high purity of lithium within it. But at the moment, it's not economically viable for you to bother to actually extract the lithium from it. So it's mad. So is there a way that we can design our products better or put legislation in place to actually incentivize people to recover these raw materials that we've already extracted and we've got a high purity supply of them but at the moment it's not worth our while to actually build that in and I'm sure you know that will change but again I think that's where design is really important because how can we make sure that things are having if we're talking about batteries again how can we make sure that not only are they lasting for as long as possible and maintaining their value as long as possible, but can they have second life applications before you then have to disassemble them and recycle them? And this whole idea of kind of stewardship of resources rather than we're just producing it and there you go, it's, it's none of our responsibility anymore, I think is really interesting. And I mean, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because who's then responsible for the stewardship of that resource? Is it gonna be the primary producer? It's probably a very different skill set to somebody who's manufacturing your electric vehicle or your battery, for example. I think, yeah, your whole piece around we need to take responsibility for the whole life cycle of that. And actually, before we can do that, we need to understand the material flows, which I know is, a, is a, not a small task. Um, so, yeah, I just think there's so much opportunity within the system to actually, A, understand what's happening, but B, take ownership of it and 
make sure that we're being responsible for these things throughout their lifetime. You know, there's something like apparently, um, I don't know if this is relevant actually, but apparently a nickel atom, by the time it ends up in a battery, has travelled around the world on average three times before it ends up in a battery because it's being mined somewhere, it's being refined somewhere, it's being processed somewhere else, it's being assembled into a battery cell somewhere else and battery pack somewhere else. And, you know, it just seems that's just that's just going into its first use. And, um, yeah, I'm just rambling now, so I'll hand that back. Thank you. 